Welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast. I'm John Stone Street. Uh, since the events at the Capitol a few Wednesdays ago, uh, in which a what's called the storming of the Capitol uh, or insurrection, depending on what news source you are actually uh, paying attention to, uh, a lot of reckoning has been taking place about the president and about, in particular, uh, the sort of uh, guilt or the sort of uh, responsibility that can be laid at the feet of Christians uh, and specifically uh, evangelicals. Uh, j- just a few uh, days ago, I came across a, a Twitter thread, uh, which is always a great place to get your information, uh, that uh, featured my two guests, two guys that I look up to and, and read uh, as much of what they write as possible. Let me go ahead and introduce them uh, and introduce the kind of the direction the conversation is going to go. Uh, first, we have Mark Tooley. He is the president of the Institute of Religion on Religion and Democracy and the editor of the Foreign Policy and National Security Journal, Providence. Uh, he is a, a Virginia guy like I am. Every time I see Mark on Facebook, he's at some place near where I grew up in some cool old building, uh, you know, giving some little historical facts. So, Mark, it's good to have you here on uh, the Breakpoint Podcast. Good to be with you, John. And then we have Dr. Andrew Walker, who is the Associate Professor of Christian Ethics and Apologetics, the Associate Dean of the School of Theology, and the Director of the Carle V. Henry Institute for Evangelical Engagement uh, at Southern Baptist, the, uh, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Andrew, I got to say, with all those titles, you should have a tie on. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Thanks, John. It's good to be with you today. No, it's good. I, you, you guys had a really interesting uh, conversation on Twitter. It started... Uh, Andrew, I think you, you started, you wrote, after seeing the role that civil religion Christianity played in Wednesday's events, I'm all the more convinced that religious liberty is absolutely urgent for us as Baptists and evangelicals to prioritize. And then you ask why, and you go through a pretty long thread. And I, I want to, it was an interesting connection to make kind of what we saw on Wednesday at the Capitol. Uh, the idea of civil religion. Uh, some people would say pagan religion. I think, Mark, you wrote an article on that actually after that calling uh, what we saw pagan religion. Uh, so, Mark, uh, sorry, sorry, Andrew, I want to start with you. Uh, where, where, where's the connection here with civil religion from what we saw? And then you made an appeal that we need to reprioritize religious liberty. Uh, and it's important to know you've got a book coming out on this in just a few months, which I'm really looking forward to as kind of a case for religious liberty. But kind of walk us through the case you were trying to make. Sure. So I think it's indisputable that if you look at a lot of the symbology that was present at the um, insurrection at Washington, Uh, I'm not going to say it was exclusively Christian, because that's obviously not the case. Mark has documented that in his own writing. There was a lot of stuff floating, uh, symbolically speaking. But I think we do need to acknowledge the fact that there was um, an improper amount of Christian symbols present at this insurrection from people having signs that said, Jesus is my savior and Trump is my president. And then literally seeing signs that say Jesus saves from those who are standing on the, uh, the balcony of the Capitol building. And there just seemed to be a lot of that, that symbology floating around that rally. And, you know, I, Mark and I are on the same page on the role of religion in society. We, we believe that society and civil society needs vibrant confessional religion in order for people to live lives of meaning and morality. But We also want to draw a line between the type of religion that has been used for the sake of propping up um, a political movement for a nation state. And what I want to say here is is to refer to um, religion as being instrumentalized. So religion is valued less for the intrinsic properties of piety and morality and more about what you can get out of religion for the sake of some exterior exterior good that still matters but is is an abuse of something from its original purpose and so to me this moment did demonstrate some misuse of civil religion in american public life and to me that civil religion manifests itself in the idea that christianity or that america has some divine charter to it some christian charter to it that is unlike other countries and moreover, that 
um, the United States government is only legitimate insofar as some form of Christianity is legally, culturally, or, or politically preferred over other types of religions. And I, I think that is that is outside the bounds of what I think our original founding was about. And I think it's outside the bounds of what confessional evangelicalism ought to be about. And so my tweet thread about religious liberty was really centered around the idea that, um, and as you mentioned, I have a book coming out on this. The way I talk about religious liberty, to me, it's it's less than it's it's it's, it's less than just um, free exercise issues. Religious liberty at its best and broadest is helping us understand the relationship between uh, temporal authority and eternal authority. And then once we distinct make distinctions on those jurisdictions, those jurisdictions then assign various roles for both the role of religion or the church and the role of the state. And so I think we just have. Um, a, a genuine conversation that we need to have about how um, American Christians conceive of their faith um, alongside of their patriotism. Now, at the same time, um, I really, really, really dislike the ubiquitous use of Christian nationalism. I think it's becoming an epithet, a very convenient epithet that is monocausal and is too simplistic and too convenient and becoming basically a, a cudgel to mean Anything I don't like about conservative Christianity, well, that's Christian nationalism. So I want to be able to say, on the one hand, I think progressives are getting it partly wrong in their understanding of what Christian nationalism is. And I also want to have the intellectual honesty of saying, I think some conservative Christians, um, you know, we can debate on how many of those evangelicals are church going evangelicals. Um, I think we should say, though, that there is a problematic element on our side that we need to have the courage and intellectual honesty to address. Yeah. Now, Mark, you responded to that, that tweet and that tweet thread kind of, I don't know if a pushback is the right word, but a clarification and whether what we saw was civil religion, what we saw was, was pagan religion. And by the way, just right then, I don't know if it's too soon to talk about memes that came out of this, but we all remember at the opening of the house chambers uh, where uh, the uh, Reverend, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the Reverend's name, prayed in the name of uh, multiple gods and then closed his prayer with a man and a woman. And then right under that is a picture of the, uh, the horned, fur-dressed, you know, shaman saying, who has summoned me from the grave, which was a really funny meme, but maybe too soon. Um, what, was your, what was your point of clarification uh, for uh, Andrew's point? Well, uh, as you noted, I saw what happened on January 6th as an example of a post-Christian neo-pagan grab for power self-assertion of a, a cultural and even racial identity. And it's appropriate that the uh, so-called uh, behorned and uh, beferred QAnon shaman was, has become the, uh, the moniker or the uh, poster boy for that movement. But uh, we can't put this all on the self-identified pagans. There aren't enough of them. Clearly there were many, many, many self-identified Christians there who believe they were doing God's will. I am uh, i don't want to criticize our charismatic friends, but it seems like a lot of them do come from a charismatic background where they uh, claim gifts of discernment and receiving a direct word from the Lord. And many of them are convinced that they had received a direct word from the Lord to uh, carry out this action, which is disturb uh, disturbing. So uh, this has been sweepingly uh, described as a uh, Christian nationalism at its worst, and like Andrew, I'm discomfited by that term, which I think is, uh, again, just uh, too sweeping, and I think is in uh, terms of uh, how it uh, demonizes almost any reference to God and country as idolatrous is very problematic. I would say that uh, civil religion was not the underlying problem with what happened at, on January 6th. And it's not the uh, fuel for the fire of this so-called Christian nationalism. I think civil religion actually provided the instruments for national unity and social peace. For much of our history, it was largely invented, crafted, sustained, perpetuated by the mainline Protestants who uh, ran our country for most of its history. And 
ultimately failed, but uh, they did a good job most of the time, and uh, they created a uh, Christian influenced, biblically influenced, but pluralistic society that had room for all denominations, Protestants, Catholics, Jews, and others, but was a reminder that our nation lived under a divine authority and our rulers were subject to a transcendent moral order. So now uh, we're bereft of these tools of civil religion. I would love to see them revived in the right way. Maybe it's too late, but I haven't seen any alternatives. And many of my evangelical friends uh, will declare that uh, civil religion is um, like in the book of Revelation, watered down religion that must be sp spit out of uh, God's mouth. Uh, but I would argue, uh, no, it is an expression of basic Christian and biblical moral teachings applied more widely. And I think it was a divine gift uh, as long as it lasted. Yeah, I, I, I want to agree with all of what Mark is saying. And the only thing I might uh, phrase differently is we, we, we could say that what happened on January 6th was shaman nationalism. Shaman nationalism, yes. Christian nationalism. But to, to Mark's broader point, I think this particular situation has uh, exposed uh, a, an opportunity to, to think about the role of religion in public life. And I think the issue of civil religion, it always... There's a catch-22 built into civil religion because I'm absolutely with Mark in saying that religion is, I think, one of those basic goods that civilization requires at the level of civil society um, for there to be basic understandings of justice, dignity, the common good. So it's, it's um, on the one hand, extremely necessary also, at the same time, there is extreme temptation built into this concept of civil religion, because civil religion, as I said in my earlier remarks, can easily become something that allows one group to claim a more centralized identity within the nation than other groups who don't claim that religion. And so to me, I, I want to make the argument that America um, is a, a nation um, intricately bound up with Christian influence at its founding. That's a separate comment than to say that America is a Christian nation. The, the, the grand experiment we're having right now is how much of America can be America as it jettisons those religious foundations. And I think that's a lot of the conversation um, that that Mark and I, I mean, we, we're allies, we, we agree with each other 99% of the time. I think that's what we're wanting to see how this plays out is, is what is the future of religion and what is the future of America in a uh, post-religious context? Yeah, or a pseudo-religious context to Mark's point, right? Uh, yeah, and I think this is such an important thing. And I have to admit right now that just given, Mark, your comments about uh, mainline Protestantism's role in history that I really failed in my introduction, because I should have started this whole uh, conversation with a, a Methodist, a Baptist, and an Anglican walk into a bar, because that's, what, that's what's happening in this conversation. We've got a broad representation here of, uh, of American uh, Christian identity. Uh, but that tension that Andrew uh, just mentioned, I think, is a really important one, and it's one that many of us felt and probably was acutely exaggerated during the last several years as we came out of uh, a, 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 an Obama administration that was more kind of directly contradictory to our deeply held values about morality, about family, about the unborn. You know, these are the things that uh, faithful Christians care the most about. Um, and coming into a guy like the, the president uh, that delivered on a lot of issues around religious liberty and about uh, pro-life things. And then, but there's this whole kind of drunk uncle problem that comes along with it of what we saw, you know, at, at, at the Capitol. And, and to me, that's, that's kind of evidence of what, Andrew, to your point, that civil religion, right? I mean, America has a deeply religious founding. It has uh, deep 
roots into specifically Christianity. Civil religion is necessary for a civilization, but it's really bad for theological orthodoxy potentially. And you know, here we have a guy like Mark, like you, you work at the Institute of Religion and Democracy talking about that relationship. And Andrew, you're at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. So I, it, this is to me, it, it's, it, it's just bringing up all the really important points. How do you understand that balance, uh, Mark, between theological faithfulness and uh, that it is often challenged by civil religion and then the civil the need for civil religion and at least to some degree for a civilization to survive or to even you know flourish well obviously any orthodox believer understands that civil religion does not offer personal redemption uh, it's not our ultimate religion uh, it's for the sake of broader society and if that's a perhaps a mistake common among evangelicals and many others that uh, the church is sufficient in and of itself and proclaim the gospel. But if the church cares about society, it does care about social harmony and uh, peace. And how do we achieve that with some commonalities that draw us together as a society and a nation? And civil religion, uh, to my eyes, was never at odds with Christianity. It usually used uh, biblical, especially Old Testament language referred to God without usually referring to the Trinity or to Jesus. So Orthodox believers certainly could affirm it, but it required a certain level of uh, confidence that the mainline Protestants had because they had been in leadership for so long. And unfortunately, I don't know that uh, with the mainline Protestants now effectively having become dinosaurs, I don't know if Catholics and evangelicals can step forward to become uh, the new, provide the new priestcraft for civil religion. They don't have that same historical trajectory, and I'm afraid that explains in part how we end up with the events at January 6th and that large numbers of uh, people in the evangelical side uh, often don't know how to apply their faith to the public sphere without uh, going into the uh, apocalyptic zone. Well, one of the things that uh, I think this, this brings up is when we talk about civil religion, we talk about Christian nationalism, um, when we talk about this new epithet, white evangelicalism, that I see almost, you know, ubiquitous on Twitter, I think it, it, it ought to force us to be really clear on what an evangelical is, both, uh, first off, it's a theological term, it's, it's not a sociological term, and I think in the mainstream media, it is more of a, a political and sociological identifier than it is a theological term. And that's, that's obviously regrettable when you look at individuals like Billy Graham and Carl F.H. Henry. Um, these are the kind of the neo evangelicals of, of the mid 20th century. They understood their project to be distinctly confessional and theological, not purely sociological. So then you, you take, you know, what began in the 1950s or the 1940s onward, um, you, can, you can understand that uh, to a great extent, they were very, very successful in terms of influencing uh, the public sphere in our understanding of, of religion. But then we have, uh, you know, a, a growing trend in at least polling where evangelical can mean almost anything under the sun, where some evangelicals very rarely ever attend church. Some self-reported evangelicals deny that Jesus is the exclusive pathway to heaven, which at that point, I really want to question the validity and usage of the term. Uh, you know, and, and evangelicals are constantly debating the concept of evangelicalism and whether it can be salvaged or whether we should just dispense with it altogether. I don't have a, a strong opinion one way or another in that debate, but I think it is perhaps worth considering whether evangelicalism as a theological term uh, has any resemblance to the theology that, that evangelicals would actually truly espouse for those of us who are, who are evangelicals. Well, and that's, yeah, and that's true, not only in the sense of civil religion, but just kind of what happens at the average church on a Sunday morning, right? I mean, you know, the, the disconnect between the theological definition of evangelical and just kind of doing the business of, I, you know, a market-driven church, that's, that, that seems to be a disconnect that doesn't just exist, I guess, in, when it comes to civil religion. Does that make sense? Certainly. And, and to me, I think 
one of the one of the things I hope comes out of this moment that we're in is um, a move toward greater institutional Christianity and away from this broad sociological amorphous term known as evangelicalism. I'm not anti-evangelical whatsoever. Um, I would consider myself evangelical, but before I'm evangelical, um, I'm convictionally Protestant. I'm convictionally Baptist. Um, and so, so for the same for an Anglican with John and a Methodist with Mark, um, we would probably all consider ourselves evangelicals, but there's something that makes us theologically distinct, even, even within our own broad uh, evangelical umbrella category. Yeah. Mark, with the, a lot of things have been written since uh, the, uh, the events at the Capitol uh, that, that are talking about the guilt, uh, the reckoning that white evangelicals, uh, to use that nomenclature, have for what happened and so on. What's your take on that? What, how much of that is legitimate? How much of that is uh, hyperbole? Well, I think it has some legitimacy, but we have to be careful how we address it. I first want to call your attention to a, a very important article that Tim Carney of the Washington Examiner wrote about the events of January 6th. He interviewed many participants almost all of whom seem to identify as some sort of Christian, but interestingly, uh, we're not church going, we're not church affiliated. They would say, uh, we read the Bible and uh, we pray and uh, we read our crazy stuff on the internet and that's about it. So they're completely unconnected to institutional Christianity. So I echo uh, Andrew's point that we need the, the reinstitutionalization of Christianity in America over and against this often destructive ultra individualism in terms of your other point no i've forgotten your question <laughs> <laughs> well just uh you know just kind of evaluating that because i think a lot of uh folks uh feel uh you know unfairly represented in the press um you know that anyone you know who felt themselves in a situation to vote for for trump or you know you know in the last election are somehow guilty uh for you know for enabling uh what we saw at the capitol well, as you say, evangelicals were already uh, widely culturally uh, demonized, and uh, that will accelerate uh, thanks to the events of last week, which is uh, unfair to the vast majority of us, but not entirely fair to our movement in that it was much of what happened last week was birthed among us, and none of us did enough to forestall it. I include myself in this category. I did not think that we would come to this moment. It seems almost unimaginable in the history of American Christianity. So we do in fact all bear some responsibility, but we also wanna push back against uh, sweeping denunciations of all evangelicalism. Uh, we cannot recover as a nation without uh, religious institutions and religious people. And so we should be focusing on how we can work together for the common good using the respective tools of our faith to build a society in which uh, we can all be ourselves and uh, be with each other as a nation. And, and I wanna have the intellectual honesty to say, yes, there were problems that we saw on display at the Capitol on January 6th. And if we have the power to correct what we saw on January 6th, let's do it. So, I mean, I think one of the things I underestimated is how the internet age has preyed upon people to believe in things that I simply think are not true. Um, I'm on the side of saying, if you want to make an argument, great, present the evidence. And so I, I do think we need to have um, a conversation, not only about conspiracy theories, I think we need to have a conversation about how life is increasingly lived online more broadly and the safeguards we need to take to protect ourselves. And quite honestly, having conversations with those in our churches, that if we see people saying things um, that do not correspond with reality, uh, that's something that ought to fall into the category of discipleship. It, it seems sometimes that we have our lives in the church and then our lives online are completely segmented. And I think we need to have a greater unity and to understand that, um, especially this has been exacerbated in a pandemic, that more of us are, are 
not only going to um, online social media platforms for news, but to seriously mediate what our understanding of reality is. So we need to have that reckoning. On the other hand, um, perhaps call me cynical, but I also think this is an opportunity for a lot of convenient scapegoating to be done. So we all know um, that there are a lot of voices that want to find any reason whatsoever to put the, you know, the, the, the definite excesses of President Trump at the, at the feet of evangelicals. If part of the reckoning on Christian nationalism and white evangelicalism is for evangelical Christians who reluctantly voted for President Trump to express regret for not voting for abortion, pronouns, sexual revolution, and the like, that's not gonna happen. At the same time, we should acknowledging, uh, acknowledge that criticizing excessive Trump devotion is legitimate, uh, but that's a separate matter than requiring positive affirmation of immoral policy. And I feel like behind a lot of the conversation happening right now uh, on social media and in various news outlets is, we want to make every Trump voter responsible for what happened on January 6th and make you regret your vote. But we all know 74 million people didn't vote for what happened on January 6th. They made a calculated decision between two options and said, this one seems like less of a problem than the other one. And we're not going to sign on to principles and policies that we think are completely contrary to our faith. Yeah. So Mark, as a historian, uh, as well as a kind of uh, someone who spends really all of his time looking at this intersection of religion and and in and, and, and the political space. I wrote a piece this past week where I wondered just how much of this, um, you know, as part of what I call a pre-existing condition to what we have seen, not only uh, at the Capitol, but also even in the chaos leading up to the election, is just the, uh, the, the, the thin civil society that we experience. The, you know, uh, Andrew pointed to online life, but you could also talk about the collapse of family, the collapse of, you know, you guys both talked about institutional church and alignment and belonging, but it just seems like the, the temperature is so high. The weight of the world has been put on the next election or the next bill or the next scandal uh, to come out of DC to change everything. And it's just like the weight of the world is on this and, and, and the temperature just boils so quickly. Uh, is, that, is that part of the story we need to look at as people of faith who care about the public square? Well, it is central to the story. And I wanna echo what uh, Andrew uh, referred to. In fact, uh, almost all of us are buying into the equivalent of uh, the transgender mythology and that we all get to emotionally choose our own reality and deny the existence of an objective reality. That's from the left all the way over to the right. It's just uh, the realities we choose are at odds with each other, but I'm not sure they're more, one is more wrong than the other. They're all uh, destructive uh, in some way. Um, all right, well, last question here. I really appreciate this conversation. I wanna ask you both from your both, you know, various con confessional backgrounds, as well as your roles in, in looking at the public square and, and, and the place faith plays. Look, we're gonna hear tons of voices coming out of this. Um, and we know this because we heard tons of voices coming out of the, you know, the Bush years and others and the Reagan years and the moral majority years saying that the answer is, is that Christians need to get out of politics and get back to discipleship. Um, and uh, that seems to me to be a fundamentally wrong understanding of discipleship, that discipleship should include politics. But I just want you guys to offer a kind of a way, a way forward here. What, 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 what lessons, based on the lessons that the church should learn, which I think you both have articulated pretty well, what, what, what's the way forward here for people of faith? Mark, let's start with you. Well, some Christians maybe should get out of politics and others need to be in. Uh, there's not a universal calling for all Christians everywhere to be in politics. Well, we we're all have, citizens, though, right? I mean, you know, there, there is a calling to be a citizen. Uh, to be a responsible citizen, yes. But the level of your political involvement, I think, is a, a distinct calling and vocation. And frankly, there are some people, I don't want them too active in politics. Uh, the people on January 6th, no, thank you. Please stay at home and uh, maybe uh, do a little better reading and some uh, self-examination. I also appreciated... Uh, 
comments from uh, President Trump's former chief of staff, uh, former Homeland Security uh, Secretary uh, General Kelly, who commented uh, over the last week that uh, before considering candidates for high office, before you even get to the issues, you need to think about character, integrity, temperament, experience, mental stability. And what it's only after you go through that litany, you get to the issues. And I think that's an important point for Christians to consider. And we also need to, uh, as I think Andrew already referenced, uh, to desacralize politics and not think that uh, the apocalypse is going to be precipitated because our candidate loses, because that's probably not the case. And sometimes we just have to accept that we lose. We examine the results, we uh, examine why we lost, and we come back and we make better arguments and we fight all the harder, but we don't just assume that uh, the dark angels are going to descend because we lose an election. Andrew, what, do you, wanna, what would you say? I wanna echo what Mark said, especially uh, his last sentiment, is I think we need to do some better thinking around the task of statecraft and around public theology in general. And I think one of those uh, things we need to be thinking about is that politics is not eschatological. So we don't need to assign a degree of freneticism and a degree of panic and a degree of zero sum analysis that I don't think scripture assigns to the task of politics. Politics is not meant to mediate the divine or the eternal. It's meant to mediate um, uh, aspects of the common good and to facilitate opportunities for people to obtain the common good and to live lives of human flourishing. So I think that means um, reinvigorating our ideas of uh, the common good. I mean, understanding that the task of politics is not about special pleading for one interest group over another, that the very best of the political, of the, of the Christian political tradition understands that all individuals are made in the image of God. And even those who are not Christians can partake in political goods that allow them to live lives of flourishing, um, which means if, if that's true, if, if a society and a government doesn't need to be uh, exhaustively Christian for it to be legitimate, that means we then need to do a better job of assigning politics the fairly limited role it ought to play um, as, as far as our understanding of the full sweep of history while also understanding that politics is deeply, deeply enmeshed with our understanding of the common good and um, how we're going to attain it. So I think this is, uh, this is a time for us to listen, to do some deep study. Um, and I, I would say simply um, calm down about politics. It's, mm. it's become fever pitched to such a degree that it's occupying too much of our lives. And we are giving Washington way more of our attention than it deserves. And a part of that is on us. I wanna acknowledge what Mark just said that um, I think everyone should look on with great sadness and even embarrassment at times about the conduct of our president. And we need to be more mindful about the role that character does play, that character is, is um, an absolutely essential component that cannot be divorced from policy. And in fact, antecedent to policy is the reality of there being a person of character who's able to lead in such a way that uh, they're effective. Well, I know this will start a lot of uh, conversations. I hope it will, because I, I just feel like uh, we, uh, you know, kind of got caught up in so many of us got caught up into the hysteria, the the, the, the rage, the, uh, the, the the anxiety of the last couple of weeks. And, um, um, you know, I, I am not one that says, you know, I, I Mark, I understand your point about not everyone should be is called to be a politician, but as citizens uh, to be re-discipled. How can the church recatechize? people into a theology of politics. And uh, Andrew, I know that you're working on that. And Mark, I know you're working on that. And I appreciate the work that both of you have done and for bringing that uh, today. I hope there's a lot more conversations like this that can happen in front of a lot more people 
so that in this time when there's not everything at stake in the next few weeks, we can just kind of sit there and retool uh, who we are as followers of Christ living in this uh, particular cultural moment. Uh, my guest today, Mark Tooley, president of the Institute uh, on Religion and Democracy, also the editor of IRD's Foreign Policy and National Security Journal, Providence. Mark, if people want to find you uh, online or elsewhere, where would you send them? Yes, check us out at our website, uh, theird.org, T-H-E-I-R-D.org. Okay, and uh, also joined today by Dr. Andrew Walker, Associate Professor of Christian Ethics and Apologetics and Associate Dean for the School of Theology and the director of the Carl F.H. Henry Institute for Evangelical Engagement at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Andrew, if people want to connect with you, uh, where can they find you? Uh, best place is probably Twitter. I'm at Andrew T. Walk. And uh, I would be remiss not to remind you that I have a book coming out in May on religious liberty that uh, I think would help us walk through some of these issues that we've been talking about. I'm really looking forward to that book. What's the title of the book so people can uh, look forward to it? And when's it coming out? It's called Liberty for All, Defending Everyone's Religious Liberty in a Pluralistic Age. We'll have you back on to talk about that when it is uh, when it is time. I'm looking forward to that. I uh, have been waiting for a book uh, that, ha that, that makes the case for religious liberty in an age when religious liberty is no longer in many arenas seen as a net positive, but seen as a net negative, uh, not defined well, but defined as the, uh, the license to discriminate. And since Andrew did a shameless plug, Mark, you got anything you want to plug? You got a book, got a video, got a you know, a, a used car, you want to you wanna pedal out there as well? You, you may well, do that. I have that. about 10 books in my head, but I can't uh, tell what's in my head quite yet. But uh, certainly check out our website, as you mentioned, and our uh, Providence Magazine, which uh, is not just about foreign policy, but about uh, Christian political and social witness overall. Providence is a, is a terrific resource, and I, I do recommend that. And also, um, I, I also recommend people find your really interesting historic posts about random places in Virginia, especially old churches, that I just find fascinating having grown up in Virginia. And that's largely on Facebook, right? Well, I'm sure you especially appreciate the uh, Lord Fairfax Chapel uh, just outside of uh, Winchester, dating back to 1790, with several uh, signings of the Constitution there in the graveyard. So a great place to visit. It is a great place to visit. I think uh, they still hold candlelight services there that are really, really cold every Christmas Eve. But I drove by that almost every day in the early years of my life. It's a beautiful part of the beautiful part of the country. So thanks for uh, bringing that up. Well, guys, I, I really appreciate uh, the, the thoughts that you brought to today's uh, uh, podcast. We'll link to the various places where you can connect with Mark and Andrew at breakpoint.org. We're also linked to some of the resources that were mentioned uh, including a link to this Twitter conversation, which I found really fascinating. Get the, get the whole thread uh, from Andrew and, and, and Mark's uh, uh, clarification on that. I thought it was a great introduction to this conversation. And thanks for taking it a step deeper. Guys, great to have you. Thank you. Thank you.